Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you may have tuned in. Welcome to this latest installment in the Black Hat webinar series, How Asurian Escaped the Fix Every Vulnerability Hamster Wheel, brought to you by Black Hat, Brinka, and Informa. Terry Sweeney here with Black Hat. I'll be your moderator today. Just a few quick announcements before we start. This webinar, of course, is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. We strongly encourage participation and are happy to take your questions and comments. After today's speakers finish, they'll be answering questions. You know the drill, just type your questions into that ask a question text box on the bottom left of the console. Special programming note for today's event, if you submit a question for today's Q&A, you'll be entered to win your choice of prize valued at over $50, courtesy of today's sponsor, Brinka. More info about them at brinqa.com. The winner will be chosen at random sometime during the week of June 12th. You must be opted in to win. As for questions, we'll be answering as many as time permits. Later in the program, we'll also be asking for your feedback about this event. If you've been here before, you know that the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can also download a PDF copy of the presentation from the resource box at the bottom of your console. We recommend you disable pop-up blockers. If for some reason slides aren't advancing, please press the F5 key on your keyboard to refresh your console. Finally, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please visit our webinar help guide by clicking on the help question mark icon on the bottom right of the console. So on to today's presentation, how Asurian escaped the fix every vulnerability hamster wheel. Our pre presenters today include Jim Desmond, Chief Security Officer with Asurian. He's joined by Ian Kirk, Director of Vulnerability Management with Asurian. Ian, take us away. Sure, so where do we start? We start in the beginning. So in the beginning, there was little structure. I won't go all the way to chaos, but it was a very decentralized situation with limited accountability and little consistency. We had work going on in pockets throughout the enterprise using email, Excel, Power BI, and those pockets had the right idea, but they weren't going to scale. So our DevOps teams had challenges knowing what vulnerabilities might be lurking in their server environments. And as we built out our new program, we even had a couple of people express surprise we had scanners, uh, despite it having been in place for a number of years. On the application side of the house, we had developers logging into three or more tools to get a sense of what risk they might have present. And as you might imagine, this wasn't really a popular exercise since it wasn't necessarily an efficient use of their time or skills with their ever increasing list of priorities. So uh, we'll go with the metaphor, the river of risk kept building up behind the old leaky dam. It, it, and the pressure, you know, especially for, from my point of view was just, it, it was building and the risk was becoming too big. Um, all the people involved were trying to do the right thing, but our effectiveness just, it just wasn't near where it needed to be for a company of our size uh, and the responsibilities that we held. Uh, you know, we simply just kept patching, patch a little bit more, rinse, repeat, be disappointed. You know, this cycle that just, wasn't doing us any good. Um, we reached a point where we recognized that we could no longer reasonably contain the risk of our vulnerability management program. We did some things that, that a lot of organizations will do. We created a risk document. Uh, we had leaders sign it and get agreement, uh, but the lack of a clear path forward, a way to turn this into something that could be done it, to spend the limited resources that were available for vulnerability management was missing. Um, and frankly, the way this was building up, the vulnerabilities, the, the, the size of the vulnerabilities, the scope of it lost meaning. It's sort of, if any of you have ever heard the, uh, the analogy of the boiling frog, right? You could, if you throw a boiling or throw a frog into a pot of boiling water, it'll hop right out. But if you put a, a, a frog in a pot of water and slowly increase the heat, well, it won't realize it's in, in danger until too late. Well, we were nearing that point, right? And we were lucky enough to, to recognize that, that there was danger there and we needed to do something. It 
really was that moment where in good faith, we couldn't say that our vulnerabilities were being managed in an effective manner. And, and, and something just had to change. Um, we had to dig in and we had to tell people how what we wanted to do was going to be do how what we we're going to do how it was going to be different how we're going to use influence persuasion and and i will admit to social engineering some of my peers to get people on board with what we we're going to do everybody in their in their heart of hearts wants to help they want to be part of the solution they want to do the right thing we just had to unify them they had to understand what we were doing and what the goal was in a way that made sense to them Otherwise, and, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, they just go back to what they were doing, to what they'd always done, whether it worked or not. Uh, so we recognized that we had to create a prioritization scheme that reflected reality. And with that, we needed to hold the individual leaders accountable to that prioritization. And not just leaders, not just leaders, you know, I could beat the head of infrastructure uh, you know, about the face and neck until he does what I want, but he's not really the one allocating the resources. It's the product owner, the business owner. So we really had to get those people to understand what their decisions to, to place uh, production over vulnerability management, over security meant, and how they could, uh, but also give them a path to affect that change. This was a, a path that, that any of you who've done large scale enterprise changes or a fan of John Cotter's book, um, you know, you create that sense of urgency, you build your guiding coalition, you, you, you create your strategic vision, and you drive forward. But like any enterprise-wide change, this was going to be a lot of work. So, you know, naturally, I, I called Ian and said, hey, I need you to do a lot of work. Yeah, so Jim said he wanted to do a lot of work, um, but what he really said was he wanted me to get rid of this team that I had created our cloud governance team. Uh, he wanted to reduce the number of people I managed uh, and he wanted me to focus on this vulnerability management thing. Um, I really honestly felt like he was asking me to leave the organization. Um, this, like he didn't, he doesn't know what he's asking me here, right? He doesn't value my experience, right? Um, this doesn't have any shine. So um, I panicked for a few days and I finally got uh, Jim cornered on his calendar and I said, okay, what's, what's going on here? And, we had a good conversation and I actually, I, I then understood his passion and his vision here. And actually this was an enterprise globally scoped mission. It had a huge impact. It had lots of visibility. It had high value to the organization. So uh, a few nerves out of the way. I didn't feel like I was getting canned after all. So um, partnered up with other folks in the security team. And we started thinking about what is it that's got to change about what we've been doing to make a new program actually have the impact we want. So what we kind of, came up with is we needed our users to self-identify that maybe they weren't great. Um, we had to kind of convince them they were part of the problem, but more importantly, part of the solution. Yeah, but they, and, and Ian's 100% right, but they couldn't be angry about the identification that they weren't great. They had to take ownership. Right, so let's do it in a way that's resonating with them, right? Let's deliver actionable information at the right time we don't need them debating with us saying, well, that vulnerability is not in production or that server is not actually internet connected. So that vulnerability couldn't possibly happen, right? We needed to tell them that we'd already factored these things into the score, keep that debate out of the question. And we needed to do it consistently in a way that helped us present risk over patching. So we wanted the, the users to really understand their engagement was critical and just running the, the monthly patch Tuesday batch job isn't going to cover everything. We want them to get in there, take ownership and recognize that they're going to have to play a part in upgrading Java. And once they upgrade Java, their score is going to drop and we're all going to celebrate together and it's going to be lovely. It, it, and what, what Ian's driving home there is that is that risk is our game in this. We, we helping leaders understand what they are facing, giving them the information to make those prioritization decisions in line with what the business wants. And I know that sounds simple, right? Saying it out loud, but it is incredibly difficult to provide that clear information so those uh, decision makers can get to where they need to be. But what we had to do with the, along with that is ruthlessly, but dispassionately, right? We couldn't be, the shame and blame game wasn't gonna work here. Well, we had to ruthlessly 
drive that engagement to make sure that it was relevant. Because if you show up one time or a few times, create a small pattern of presenting risks that can be argued as irrelevant, it throws the whole program into question. The credibility teeters on a knife edge in that beginning, you know, as you reach that apex of your change, you got to make sure that you are providing the true risk to ensure the information is relevant and it will drive that action and change the culture in the way you need it to happen. You know, we're lucky here at Assurian that our security team is recognized as a key component of the organization. We run alongside the business as they try to, to you know, maintain or, or create competitive edge and be successful. Acknowledging the, the risk association and how it different, differed from patch management. This was not about your missing critical patches. This was about you're presenting additional risk to our business, to our way to be successful and driving senior leader interest and turning it into ownership. You know, making that risk, both the macro business risk, but also the, you know, hitting that .NET vulnerability relevant to each one of those teams was just a, a critical piece in driving forward this program. You come up with a beautiful mission statement and I figured out um, this is a really big sentence and I have to take a deep breath. So to deliver a mission statement is to deliver a vulnerability management program across the enterprise to inspire and empower teams with enriched intelligence and advanced tools to identify known vulnerabilities, threats and risks and ultimately transforming the way we prioritize and remediate to better protect our people and assets. I really wish we'd made that shorter. Um, it's such a run on sentence. Um, but with that like super inspiring sentence uh, statement, right? We, we then boiled that down into kind of three primary goals, right? So uh, deliver a central location to store and review our vulnerabilities. Optimize our remediation efforts based on the true risk of the vulnerability with the acknowledgement that resources are scarce and then collaborate with our global community to continually improve the price, the process and prioritization. So probably I figured out that Brinka was our choice for the centralization. Um, we saw that they could help us get our broad range of sources into that buzzworthy single pane of glass. Uh, I hate that, um, but I said it. So um, as we got into customizing our score in order to optimize our remediation, we quickly saw how that's gonna help our focus our limited resources on those things that were most risky to us. When you look at a CVSS score, that's a very benchmarky situation. So when you start bringing in the concepts of your defense in depth, right? Do I have a WAF? Do I have, you know, this is isolated, et cetera, et cetera. That helps us buy some time on some of the vulnerabilities, bring them back a little bit so that you can focus on those things that are much bigger risk to us. So suddenly we were no longer boiling the ocean and the sigh of relief was audible from across the enterprise. Um, everybody really calmed down when we went, when we weren't telling them these really giant numbers, when it was a much more like human number, they could say like, oh, I got that. So step three, collaboration. We have a couple hundred people logging into the system most days. We've got really steady communication with them, right? We've got a chat channel in teams to help with technical stuff or for them to call out where we've got data issues. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, we have our monthly reviews with senior leaders to kind of keep a pulse check going on with them. Um, we have various forums that we've had along the way to discuss the scoring changes, to talk about prioritization of new data sources and other roadmap focused efforts. I will say it's not always roses, but we feel pretty good about our engagement across the organization. It, it, and the partnership on that side can't be underestimated. You know, the partnership in there, we, we had one of our, our, one of the senior leaders, our product dev leader, instantiate regular security reviews with each one of his products, where there is a, a broad range of partnership with the infrastructure teams, security teams, the product development teams, even the product teams involved, using it as an expectation setting vehicle. And, and I want to drive this home here. Do not underestimate the power of peer pressure. Right, being not necessarily called the carpet and shamed for what you're doing, but brought out and saying, hey, this is risky. Can you explain to your peers why you're struggling with this? And also a really good form to get ahead of the, uh, well, I didn't think it was a real risk, right? Well, let's have that conversation. And the more often we did that, the more often 
uh, Ian would get a phone call and say, hey, you need to go talk to Ian's team about why you think that isn't real. The other side is that, and it goes with the security review, is the partnership with key leaders, getting their buy-in. Um, and I know, you know, everybody says that by that buzzword, you got to get buy-in of your senior leaders, but getting them at the very least to not force their teams to buy in, but keeping them from allowing them to resist it, right? We were, we were frankly to them, to our constituents, proposing to boil that ocean. And, and no one objectively thought we could do it. Uh, but we needed them to believe that I thought we could do it, right? That Ian and I believed that we could get in there and do it. And I think that was enough to overcome that initial resistance. That partnership got us to the point where the technology and the prioritization that we had put in got us over that, again, that tipping point that was so crucial. So then Jim needs to know who all of our partners are. So the metadata was a really big deal here. So as Assyrian moved into the cloud, we recognized that we were going to have to identify who the financial and operational owners were of all this stuff that was going out into the cloud. So tagging was our answer. So very simply, we required everybody to have a specific key value pair, which we call our platform tag. If you didn't include that key value pair, or you didn't type it correctly, or you didn't pick it from our list, your resource gets removed in 45 minutes. Uh, it was a really rapid way to teach people to add that platform tag. And so uh, given that Pavlovian success, it was, it was really valuable to us. And then we started to spread that platform tag across other stuff in the enterprise. So our on-premises servers started picking up that tag, our code repositories and so on and so forth, so that this single value can tie back to a really rich set of information. We can tell you the contact list, the accountable senior leader, the responsible application lead, all sorts of stuff. And that information is user editable. So they can go to a single place, update that, you know, Jim's moved into a new role and so it's now Ian's problem, right? So it's very dynamic and they don't have to go change hundreds and hundreds of tags it's just this one connector of that kind of metadata from platform tag to owners. So then we get into engagement, right? And so Jim's already kind of said it, and I'm going to say it again. We're here not for blame and shame, right? Or name and shame, but empathy and support. We want to meet our teams where they are and offer to help them make improvements. This was a really big deal in the security reviews. These are not calling you onto the carpet and making you feel bad. It's what resources do you need? Who else might have solved this problem? Let's get you connected and get this taken care of. And what a difference. You no longer have that Excel sheet or, or chart of disappointment, right? Of CVS as disappointment. You, you now have people that are responsible, feeling responsible for the outcome. You know, and, and Ian will talk more about this later, but some of the prioritization things we do, they would say, you know, why is this risk so high? We'd say, well, you have PII on it or you it's connected to the internet or or something like that. And they go, oh, it's not supposed to be or this server is supposed to be gone, let me decommission it. Giving them the way to address that risk really got them to feel responsible for the outcome. Instead of just go patch .NET, go patch Java, it really changed how they felt about it. Um, and, and the other thing is, is that we saw as this engagement evolved, you know, teams, especially in our infrastructure team, they started having a friendly competition. Which team could lower their score faster? Which team had the lowest overall risk scores? Things like that. It was a, it was an incredible turn of, you know, them not wanting to talk about vulnerability management and feeling, you know, a little bit of shame around their ownership to being completely bought in. And that was through that engagement, through that passion, and and, and just as importantly, that metadata that that Ian talked about. Um, on the other side, and on here it says, find your heroes. I, I selected Ian uh, and Ian selected his team for a specific reason, reason. We needed a team of passionate technologists with broad backgrounds that had a lot of experience in our, in our enterprise. Like any other company that's been around for more than a couple of years, you have your legacy technology, you have your tech debt, you have your things that everybody, you know, your known unknowns that, that are out there. We needed people with that experience, but also we needed them to be our heroes, to be invested and passionate, right? And that is Ian and his team for us. They're a relatively small team, but they're dedicated to helping, right? And Ian said it earlier, getting in there and with empathy uh, and with understanding and helping get them where they want to go. 
that approach versus you're behind, you're behind, you're terrible, you're behind to how can I help you? Do you need the server? Let me let me help you pinpoint your your biggest piece of risk is just it's a game changer. Um, the other side is that this team thinks outside of the box, right? They have done things like creating a zero day process, uh, creating an end of life calculation for operating systems and other software so that it doesn't just trip the day it goes end of life or out of support. They know months before slowly increasing the pain in their risk score it, or whether or not a server has been reboot and a adding, you know, rebooted after a patch and adding some of that risk management stuff. The key to this is that the, the creation of those is that these are not run book operators, right? Gave them the room and the tools to make the impact and they moved quickly onto the next challenge. It was varied, it was interesting, and I'll tell you what, they're not done. Um, they are you know, in there, every challenge that they have been put in front of them, they have addressed. Um, the last thing I'll say about this team is that every time one of the constituents comes in and says, I don't like this data or your data is wrong, it has to be addressed. Not angry, and again, you know, I'm using Ian's words, empathy and sympathy, you go in there with like a partner, valuing that they took the time to tell you about it, talking them through it, helping them, gaining understanding, committing to helping and getting it fixed. I cannot tell you the culture shift and the norms of our of our operations that HIS has created felt far beyond vulnerability management. Oh, now that Jim's talked me up so much, uh, with this team. Yeah, Ian, you should dust off your cape, right? Get it yeah, on. exactly, yeah. Uh, so with this team of passionate technologists, we really leaned in on using and customizing Brinko. Um, Asurian really loves to either build our own or customize the heck out of stuff. Um, we've had products where sometimes the vendor can't recognize it any longer. Um, so Brinko was a really great fit for us. So the out of the box connectors were really super important for our major tools. They were a big foundation for us. But as we hit into you know, unusual things, we were really excited about the generic sources like a CSV or a SQL connector, right? So we've got a custom solution that's in-house for our cloud auditing. That's just in a SQL database. And so there's no connector going to come up with our cloud you know, auditing system. But we don't have a roadblock because I've got these folks that can really get in there, write those queries, get that stuff done, get that dumped out, load it in there. Or if we're exp experimenting with a new tool that Brinka is, is still building the connector for, we've got the skills that we're just going to get the API and drop that down to a file and get that in. And we're on the road to understanding how that's going to fit into our bigger picture here. Um, another really big thing here is getting all of the asset data loaded and consolidated. Brink has been a really big help with that. We're pulling data from up to six different data sources. So Vuln scanners, cloud platforms, virtualization platforms. And we're taking the best parts of those asset pieces and making that into a single asset record. And coming back to where we were talking about the metadata, right? All of our assets, all of those assets, vulnerabilities, all of those application issues, they're all tying back to a platform tag. So we know who our partners are. We need to, we know who we need to go talk to, right? But we can also do access control. So not only does that, you know, provide peace of mind of, you know, I'm not necessarily giving everybody all the keys to all the vulnerabilities everywhere in our enterprise, but more like realistic or more like the concern of the end user is they don't have to dig through everybody else's stuff to find what they're working for. When they log in, they say, I'm a part of this team and I see this stuff. And it's just that simple. And then over time, just like Jim said, we've moved from just taking the vulnerability data from our scanners and we started creating risks that are based on the data we've collected in Brinka. You haven't rebooted your Windows server in 30 days, boom, that's a risk. You're running an operating system that's going to go into life in 12 months, boom, that's a risk. That is now set up next to your asset and you see that you're running Windows too old and you have these .NET vulnerabilities, right? And so that really ties into the fact that we're continually analyzing our data. My team is, is sitting there, we get a free couple of minutes and we start kind of filtering and clicking around and just seeing what's going on and finding the patterns. So. One of those patterns is we recognize teams were slow or hesitant to upgrade their operating system because they actually didn't have enough advance notice that it was going to go end of life to plan for it. So we had the OS name and the target dates, so why shouldn't we just inform them? Um, again, I'm going to keep saying nothing's perfect here. We make plenty of mistakes. Jim's already talked about it, right? 
But the key thing here is we take ownership of those mistakes and those data errors. We announce them in the Teams channel. Sometimes we've even got to go to our newsletter of uh, you know eight, 900 people. And, and a couple of months ago, I, I did one of those. Like, oops, we made a mistake. A bunch of you folks are going to see a big score increase. Um, so sorry, this is the root cause. This is how we're fixing it. Nobody freaked out, nobody panicked. And we've almost cleared that spike from that little bug. So challenges, keep, keep being real here. Not everything's perfect, right? Um, we've had challenges with the volume of data we were bringing in and the wide breadth of sources, right? We've had to be, be very carefully kind of coordinating the data synchronizations. And we've had to be very deliberate about how some, how dynamic some of the data presentations are. Um, when you're going across as many records as we might have, sometimes you don't just do a live query. Um, so we've got to we've got to think ahead a little bit on making sure that we're calculating things. Um, we have had pains adjusting our customized score, trying to find that happy medium that doesn't undersell the risk while also making sure that we're getting all the data elements loaded that make sure that the score makes sense. We still have lots of room to go there. Um, we still haven't nailed down how do you programmatically decide that that particular uh, open source package, my code isn't calling the function that's impacted. We, we don't have an answer. Um, probably investing in a, another tool that's really going to get down in there, we're not there yet. Um, and I'm going to be really blunt and, and, and call Brinka out, right? We had some challenges with getting Brinka where we needed it to be when we started. Um, this is uh, two and a half years into the program, right? Uh, we pushed them really hard. We, we we used to joke that we pounded the table, um, but they saw we were we, where we wanted to be, right? And things really fell into place pretty quickly. After a little bit of pain, a lot of meetings, we made some really good friends, and we've really enjoyed having them a, a, as a partner throughout this effort. You know, Ian has a good point. This wasn't all, you know, unicorns and rainbows. Uh, the resistance was real. You know, every organization has those transactional people who are good at keeping things efficient and operational, but they don't like change. They're not transformational. Uh, we call them cockroach survivors, right? They, they, they wait and see. They look to see the early adopters and whether or not they die or get skewered. Um, but we kept coming back to them, right? It was the classic resistance to change. Um, you know, but we had those partners and we had agreement with them, asked to see the numbers in Brinka. Right, they would come back and they pull their own numbers. And go, no, it looks like this, and their leader would go, "Have you talked to Ian's team?" And they'd say, "No." Well, then don't come talk to me. Go get it figured out over there, and then we'll talk. And when when we did this, it gave us the room. And again, what Ian said to address this and was huge. It took time. I mean, it sometimes I, I I was convinced I would see Ian like like you know his arm around somebody and making him feel better that they're 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 the vulnerability actually was a vulnerability and that they were stuck with it, right? But what, all that aside, this allowed us to move into a vision, right? We had a vision for this that is just a little bit bigger than, than the vulnerability management itself. We have a vision here how security handles risk management, how risk management is going to work. Now, now, right now for us, Brinka is the center of our risk globe and everybody hates that term. I use a three-dimensional view of risk load, but it's the only one I got. Uh, but it is a multi-dimensional multi look at risk where we incorporate other things that come in that help us inform us where we need to spend our time. We only have so many calories of energy to expend on mitigating risk, right? So we want to make sure that, that we're investing those dollars, those resources, those people in the right place. You know, whether it's business continuity plans, or third-party risk, right? Or, or whether or not um, our SecOps threat management, you can see that up there on the, on the thing all on the screen. All of those have a way of informing our risk management. This is where we're headed. We're gonna use that tagging on and identification and, and as importantly, the right taxonomy, right? What's an application, what's an API, what, what's a program, that sort of thing. So that we can pivot around the organization and figure out what is creating risk for the organization? So if I have, you know, a, a cloud-based system that, that we do application development on and it's got some vulnerabilities on it, but also it turns out the vendor was recently breached and we're getting some threat management information that they run a, you know, log4j in their background, 
that on my risk lobe is going to stick way out, right? And instead of just like, did, the, did you patch Java? We'll go, hey, you've got a real problem here that's bigger than all the others because these components get together, which is, is allowing us to articulate in a way the business understands. And sometimes, and I think this is one of the questions that pop up, the company will, our organization will accept the risk, right? It's not very often, but this is a business and it, and it is a risk management game, right? You invest money, hope people buy your, your widgets. If they don't, right, that's the risk that you're trying to mitigate. But what we can do with this strategy, this vision going forward is give a real complete picture of the risk of a product or a technology or, or a vendor, right? Putting that view together so we can make informed decisions uh, for now and then moving into the future. Um, so you're probably all sitting there, what are the outcomes? What are the, what are the big reveals? Uh, you know, I can't reveal too much information, but I'll tell you the biggest, biggest one is that we had well over an 80% reduction in our critical and high vulnerabilities right out of the gate. I, I shouldn't say right out of the gate. Right out of the gate, there was a big reduction. And then through Ian's and his teams and frankly, the rest of our technology and product development people's tireless efforts being focused because they had the right information, knocked that stuff down and significantly reduced risk for assurance. We also developed a working framework for expanding conversations around risk. We got the engagement of everyone we wanted, but we didn't know how to get where we needed to be. Now we're there, right? We feel like we've got people speaking from the same tax taxonomy and they're identifying their assets and, their, and the things of value the same. And it has been a game changer for us. So I'm just going to kind of repeat what Jim said, that reduction, that conversation it was all done through significant engagement from all of the teams across the entire global enterprise. At this point, Jim's already given the example. We've got teams taking responsibility for stuff. We've got groups that are taking responsibility for creating their own reports. They're undertaking their own projects to automate some aspects. It has been an amazing just journey to, to take something that was so dangerously, you know, punching people in the nose to having them say like, oh, I really, thanks for letting me know, I'm going to go getting that taken care of. Um, I, I think I just want to kind of end on like the idea of the, the empathy, the support, the, the partnership and the teamwork is where we made our success. Um, and and that's, that's huge. <laughs> 100%. So that's us. So um, I guess we can go into some of these questions here. Well, well I think Terry, you want to? Terry, you monitor for us here? here. I am. Yeah, guys, thank you so much. Um, terrific breakdown of the nuts and bolts behind vulnerability management. Not to mention the the technical and prioritization issues that arise as you guys work to reduce risk all across the organization. Um, before we dive into the questions, just a few quick reminders. That PDF copy of today's presentation can be found in the resources box on your console. Also, please fill out that feedback survey, which will open on your computer. Thanks in advance. Your, your feedback allows us to improve on future events. <clears throat> As a reminder, if you submit a question for our speakers today, you'll be entered to win your choice of prize valued at over $50, thanks to today's sponsor, Brinka. The winner will be chosen at random and notified the week of June 12th. You must be opted in to win. To learn more about Brinka, go to brinqa.com. So uh, without more ado, let's let's dive right into the, the, the questions here. Uh, thanks so much to the audience for really responding to the material here. Um, Ian, let's, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Jim, this is probably a question for you. Um, sure. Did Ian's current role as director of vulnerability management um, exist when Ashurian began experiencing some of these problems? Uh, no, it did not. Ian was running our uh, a couple of teams. He had our pen test team, our red team, um, and he was also running a, a pretty important group called Cloud Operations. Uh, but the, the thing that underscores that is look at the breadth and depth of him running those teams. Um, means, right? He had expertise in every single one of those areas. He knew where, I don't want to say where the bodies are buried, 
but he knew where the bodies were buried. Um, and, and frankly, I don't think, and Ian's going to blush and he's going to not like me saying <laughs> this, I don't think I would have gone through this without some, without Ian or without someone just like him. It was a unique set of capabilities, leadership, technology, skills, and everything else that, frankly, he was linchpin in getting this done. And I'll tell you, I'm not ashamed to say this, and Ian knows that I used, I mean, everything I said was honest and truthful, but I used a lot of persuasion on Ian. Well, great stuff and bravo, Ian. Um, <laughs> uh, another question from the audience that um, uh, is uh, addressing the, the, the compulsory need to get leadership buy-in for, for big changes like this. Um, Jim, can you kick us off and just talk about some of the things that were key to getting leadership buy-in to proceed with the Brinka solution? Yeah, if, you, if you're faced with a large enterprise change, um, I recommend you do one of two things, either go out and buy John Cotter's book, Leading Change, or at the very least, search um, uh, eight steps of change uh, that John Cotter has. Um, I'm not kidding that, that you know, creating a sense of urgency, creating the, the guiding coalition, celebrating early wins, he's got a, a fantastic framework for it, including communication channels, you know, your communication strategies, how to reach the right uh, audiences in the right way, whether it's a personal conversation, email, you know, a newsletter or all of the above and how often and frequency and things like that. It was a multi-dimensional effort to do it. Uh, but I will say this and I'll sum it up with one, the one most important piece is that sense of urgency and then providing the solution to that sense of urgency is critical, to, especially the senior leaders. We have got a failure here that's not working and I have got a solution that I think it can get us here. Lots of work, but I think we can get it. I need you to help me get there. Excellent. Um, Ian, turning to you, um, audience member is asking, what context are you using for determining the relevancy dimension? Are things like publicly available exploits, actively being exploited by threat actors you care about, internet facing risks, th th those sorts of things. Can can. Yeah, I mean, I think the question almost answered answered itself. I, those are absolutely the things that we've got mixed in there, right? So, we're we're checking to see like where does this this asset sit in our network, right? And clearly, if you're if you're on the edge, be it directly or or indirectly, right? You know, if you're through a load balancer, you're still on the edge. So we're gonna we're gonna give that a little bit more priority and say that's a bit more important. Um, we deal with PCI compliance, so PCI is gonna get mixed in there. Um, absolutely getting threat intel to kind of wrap into things, to kind of tweak things. So you've got the score at the, what we call the definition level, and then we're going to do the asset context at the same thing there. Um, I will say that we haven't had as much context, kind of alluded to it earlier, on the application side of things. It's still something that we're trying to work through how to programmatically nail that down. But infrastructure has got a lot of levers you can pull it's just a matter of making sure you don't uh, throw them too many in there that you, you've lost all sense of how you got from A to B. Excellent. Ian, another one for you. Um, can you describe exactly how the tagging mechanism works? Where is the, the key value added and, and, and what is searching for it? Does this work for on-prem assets um, as seamlessly as it does in the cloud? Yeah, um, the second part first, no. Um, not exactly. So when, when you're dealing with the cloud, right, um, you've got in Amazon, you can put 50 key value pairs. So you have to put the word platform and then we have a dictionary, which is not in you know a dropdown or anything, right? So the platform is a, is a dictionary of 180 values. And so you've got to put that in the right case and the right typing and you don't put any leading and trailing spaces. And through our custom uh, mechanism, we are, checking to see like, oh, you just started an instance. Does it have that tag? Does that tag match our dictionary? I think Amazon has since released a tag enforcement capability. Um, so like I said, what we've done custom is check against dictionary. If you're not there, we're going to send you a warning. Um, if it's still there after 45 minutes, it's terminated. Um, running an EC2, it's gone, done. And we went with 45 minutes, veering off into cloud governance land. But we went into to 45 minutes because we felt like that was um, a, long enough for you to deal with it, and B, not so long that you really got 
you made yourself at home. Um, if we told you, you know, you had a couple of days and we killed your instance and you had stuff on it and we really made a, a big deal, a bit of a problem there. Um, on premises, it's a bit more of a, a jury rig, right? We've got a mapping database. So as you go through and you request a VM, um, it's going to write out to a separate mapping database, but the choices from that drop down in, in that, like I want a VM box are locked to our dictionary. So it works a little bit better there because you can't typo anything. Jim, a question for you. Um, do you have a risk acceptance process that acknowledges the understanding and acceptance of business risk? Yes, and it is a mature process. Um, and it is one that we try very hard not to use like a bludgeon. It is not a political tool. It is a statement of fact, a statement of risk, and it is handed to a senior leader. And depending on the, the severity, which is graded, but also there is some uh, subjectivity uh, discretion on my part. Um, I, you know, I simply won't let the, the guy who, who is the developer leader of a product go, I accept the risk when he's the one who created it, right? the business has to accept it. So either we'll go up a level or we'll move to the product level all right, and get that accepted. But it is it is followed, it is documented, it is formal. And, and I absolutely, you know, if you're of a, a security organization of any, you know, moderate size, you should have one of those. It's not to play CYA, it's to raise awareness around risk. Excellent. Um, I think this question may be for both of you. Um, did you try out multiple vulnerability management platforms? And if so, what pushed you towards Brinka? Um, Jim, do you want to kick that off or? Uh, Actually, I'll let Ian yeah. take that. That's a good one for him. Yeah, um, we, um, I mean, we started with roll, we were trying to figure out if we could roll our own, we were going to kind of make it happen uh, through our own process. We we're going to try to lever it into Splunk. We were going to try to, keep building on the Power BI that we had done internally. Um, none of these felt like they were quite in the right space, right? ACLs or, or, or reporting or dashboarding or things like that. Um, we looked at a couple other folks in the market um, at the time, this is two and a half years ago. Um, and Brinka really was attractive to us. Um, and I, I kind of mentioned earlier, because we could see there was a lot of customization to it. There was plenty out of the box. There was plenty that was a foundation um, but we really kind of saw it as a framework and we knew that we had the skills, we hired the talent that wanted to get in there and make things work. Um, so that flexibility that Brinka offers us is really what um, kind of nailed it down for us. Um, yeah. I, I'll, I'll add two points to that. You know, when he said Power BI, I made a finger gun gesture to my head and it wasn't because there was anything wrong with the Power BI. They were doing great stuff. As a matter of fact, they were pushing Power BI in places I didn't know you could do, um, but we recognize that the the inherent complexity of it uh, and the, as long as you were trying to do this side of desk, it wasn't gonna go. That's why I sort of made that gesture. Um, you know, the other thing I'll say around that is when we struggled a bit, and Ian brought this up earlier, we pushed Brinka hard, and I'm not shilling for Brinka here. They responded well. Right, they brought the resources to bear, saw, I think finally understood our vision and our desire and what we were looking for the system to do and responded well. It's probably why we're still on the platform. Thanks for that. Um, Ian, I think this one is for you. Um, does risk go down based on the asset or location? For example, I'm being asked to ignore vulnerabilities in dev tools. Um, yes and no, right? We really, um, on a on an asset side, we're not really saying, well, this is dev and this is prod um, because you could still, you know, if you go fish a developer and the developer then, you know, jumps you into the dev, into the non-prod environment, right? We're, I've still got a problem. Um, we have on the application side, we have these conversations and, and I'm beginning to be a broken record. We haven't programmatically been able to identify, um, but you know, like this is actually just a dev artifact. It never actually reaches the edge. Um, where we can identify those things, we will deprioritize that. So that's more of a code problem. On an asset side, no, you don't really get a free pass because it's dev, right? I don't call anything dev. <laughs> Good. Jim, I think this question is for you. Um, for a small team that's trying to change culture and drive change to vulnerability management, 
Um, leaving the whole leadership buy-in issue aside, which I think we've addressed, um, what would you suggest the first steps to be in shifting the way cybersecurity is viewed and ultimately managed in the enterprise? Um, can you read the last part of that question again? Yeah, Sarah? sure. I, I think what they're getting at is, um, it, well, let's say this is a, for a small team trying to change culture and drive change to vulnerability management. Mm -hmm. um, what are some good first steps to shifting the way that cybersecurity is viewed um, and managed in an organization? Yeah. You know, um, the words, hi, I'm from security and I'm here to help, right? <laughs> are, are usually not associated together, the security part. Uh, but that is the, the part that you need to change. There is a mindset, a guardian mindset that exists in many cybersecurity people. And frankly, that, you know, the sheepdog thought frame where I'm here to protect the herd is very common in cybersecurity professionals, right? I bet I, I, you don't want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Um, but the, the reality is, is that we're here to help our product security engineers, which are people who help our coders and, and do things like that. They spend almost all of their time acting as consultants, acting as coaches, acting as technical resources, instead of wagging their finger and saying, that looks bad. Don't do that. Right. It, and I'm going to say all these, you know, business words, shift left, everything else. But the, the fact of the matter is, is you need to engage in a helpful way. I'm running alongside the business to help it be successful. If you start to set yourself apart with a badge, right, or whatever it is, you know, I'm, I'm the cop, you're immediately going to create a distance, a friction, and a lack of trust. I think I saw a question about vulnerability in here somewhere. You need to create that trust that you have their best outcome in mind, right? Sometimes you're going to say no, like a parent, son, I just can't let you run with the scissors downhill. Mm -hmm. They will come to appreciate that you cut, you know, you prevented them from making a mistake, but you got to do it in a way that's helpful. Oh, wait, hold on, Jim. There's the, there's your last year saying, we're the team of no K N O W, not the team of no. <laughs> In. Yeah, that's not my best work, but it, it does get to the I, point. But, it, but it, it, it summarizes what you just said, right? Let's yeah. let's be partners and friendly and, and yeah. Good stuff. Um, Ian, I think we're back to you. An audience question, do you use Brinka Connect to bring data in that doesn't yet have a connector built for it? We have not started using Brinka Connect. It uh, it keeps getting on the list and back off the list. Um, we've We've been successful with with the more you know uh, traditional CSVs and, and SQLs that we just haven't leaned in on Connect yet. Ian, another one for you from the audience. Um, how many people on your staff, either full-time equivalents or contract staff, not including system vulnerability owners? Yeah, um, I have four people working for me. Uh, they're all full-time. Uh, we're all uh, stateside, uh, despite being a global organization. Um, and what's really interesting about that is, um, like I said, we've been on we've been on this journey with Brinka for two and a half years. Um, so vulnerability management has been around for two and a half years. Um, we were pretty heads down, all five of us, in vulnerability management. We're going to go with eighty percent of the time for a year and a half, and we've come up out of that um, in the last little while. Um, and my team has gone back to what we kind of started as is our security development team. So my group has the opportunity to go out and help and automate and make efficient the rest of the security organization. And uh, what was really interesting about that is that going through the vulnerability management process and the success that we've seen was the best sales pitch to our teammates that we're here to help them get faster at stuff too. Um, so we've got, uh, yeah, four people, five with myself, but we're flexing in and out of, of vulnerability management now that we've gotten things established. Yeah, I want to, I want to crow on um, Ian's team here for a second, and I won't give any specifics, but we had a, a vendor, a security vendor that had a publicly exposed API that they exposed purposefully, right, for their customers to use. They never figured anybody would be able to use that API without a, um, a professional services engagement. And while talking with the vendor about their professional services engagement, one of Ian's team was looking at the API and he goes, oh, never mind, I got our data, we're good, thanks, right? It, it, and I'm telling that because that out of the box thinking that I wanna solve this problem, 
I want to make it better. Never settling for just this is what I do. You know, seeking for that transformation has been the key ingredient that has made this go. Absolutely. Ian, uh, back to you from an audience question. Could you please provide any views of your instance? We, we are also uh, a Brinka user and are interested in comparison. Anything you can provide there? Yeah, um, I think I, I've already sent a note to, to Lauren and the Brinka team and, and uh, we'll make some connections outside of this. Excellent, all right. Um, Jim, this, this one, I think one is for you. Um, did you have any challenges getting stakeholders to accept ownership of applications or assets in your environment? And how did yeah. you overcome that? Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, it, not super significant, but there were pockets of it. Um, you know, for instance, there was confusion uh, on an infrastructure team providing a server and then does the DevOps team own the patching or does the infrastructure team own, right? And so, what we really had to do was just bring people into a room. And again, as I sound like hamburger helper hand, right? Getting in there and saying, hey, we're here to help you guys solve this. They think you're patching, you think they're patching. How, why can't we all just you know, figure this out? And sometimes, I mean, sometimes I know Ian felt like he was you know, part technician, part father, part you know, big brother, you know, shepherding people, but it really is, and, and I can't under, or I, I don't want to understress this, I want to stress it, is that the human side of this change was, you know, 40 to 60% somewhere in there, you know, give or take 8% of the of the, the work, getting them to understand what their responsibilities are and how they could affect change. I know we say this word empowerment and engagement, and they sound silly when they're, they don't have context, but when you see the spark in somebody's eye who goes, well, if I just go and do this, my numbers drop. I'm going to go do that, right? I, I, and in the early days of the program, the number of servers that you know Ian and his team were recommending for decommission because they had just been not forgotten, but you know, oh yeah, we sort of patched that, we don't really need it, and they'd shut it off. Not only did we save money, right? We saved resources, saved time, and we lowered our overall risk. All right. Um, some some other questions from the audience here. Um, does the threat intel data you use also include telemetry? Um, the answer to that is not yet. If I'm understanding the question in the context, which is, am I taking telemetry from our security operations, um, security operations teams like Splunk and or you know our Intel provider and feeding it directly into Brinka? Not yet. However, we do have some processes like our zero day. And Ian, if I'm stepping all over this, you, you correct me. But like our zero day process. If our Intel providers step up and say, using Log4j as an, as an example, there's a, a hot zero day that needs to be fixed, that will actually trigger a process for us. It automatically escalates and brink it and starts notification and kicks off a, a, a cert for people to get moving. But the, the direct feed of, of that uh, threat Intel into Brinka is not there yet. That is part of that risk globe that we're working on. All right. Uh, we have time for just a few more questions. Um, uh, interesting one, um, Ian, I think this one might be for you. Um, have there been any notable examples of teams at Assurian that have used um, this opportunity uh, to revisit some of their own internal practices, uh, possibly to get ahead of the curve, improve hygiene, reduce the amount of ongoing technical debt being carried? In, in any sense of that? Yeah, um, we've had a lot of groups that really kind of recognized that they didn't have a robust system. Um, they they weren't, you know, they didn't really think that they, they, they said, oh, well, we're patching every month. But but when you really started looking at the details, like, oh, I missed that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in that other auto scaling group that we don't. Yeah. OK, well, can you can you please do that? Um, so we got a lot of folks really working out. Um, you know, better, honestly, it's a kind of a weird thing where we got asset management along with vulnerability management. I think Jim already talked about the decom process, right? Um, lots of things, right? Recognizing their operating systems were coming up and, and oh, we should make this shift. Um, we've seen such a huge reduction in in old stuff and outdated things and, and a steady state, right? Jim talked about an 80% reduction. That reduction is through action, 
Um, that's an 80% reduction from when we started with Brinka using Brinka's numbers. That's not, uh, you know, I didn't inflate it to make Jim think I did a good job. Um, so that 80% reduction is through people engaging with the platform, recognizing their responsibilities and keeping up with it. So we're, we're really in there. We're sending them scorecards. They're, they're wanting to be better and they're asking, how do I make a better, more sustainable patching infrastructure process? Um, the other thing is, is I, and I'll, I just popped up from another question that's in there, right? Workstations, our desktop team was doing tons of work, has always been doing tons of work, but the partnership with our desktop endpoint engineering team and Brinka, you know, vulnerability management program has seen significant in decreases in our overall vulnerability at the endpoint. Um, we had some places, some pockets of the organization that were really way out there and Brinka and, and, and consolidating this data really helped us identify a pattern of like, oh no, if we just did this one thing in this one pocket, we would eliminate a hundred thousand vulnerabilities. Um, so it's not even just about getting into, you know, the, the DevOps or the app teams and talking about their code or those, those pockets the desktops are a huge part of that and they were a massive um, a massive partner in our success. Hey, there, there's a question there that's related to this. We can kill two birds with one stone, which is we do servers, we do workstations, we do uh, network stuff, but we also have our application vulnerabilities in there as well, right? So we, whether it comes from our SAS or our DAST the, or they're getting fed in there, they get a little adjudicated by our product security team, but they get in there and they're, part of that product security group, looking for a holistic view of the risk a particular product server, whatever view of the risk you're looking at represents. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to call time. Um, this is a, a great conversation and a, a incisive discussion. Um, but uh, I, I, before we go, I do want to thank both Jim Desmond and Ian Kirk of Asurian for their insights and expertise you've given us a brand new way to think about vulnerability management and reducing risk. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank thank you, you, Terry. Thanks as well to our audience for attending today's Black Hat webinar brought to you by Black Hat, of course, as well as Brinka and Informa. We'll be sending you an email with a link to access this presentation on demand. Please feel free to share it with colleagues who couldn't be part of today's live presentation. On behalf of our guest experts, Jim Desmond and Ian Kirk of Asurian, and our sponsor, Brinka, thanks for your time today. This has been Terry Sweeney for Black Hat. We'll see you next time.